On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who is behind Inside Learning? I got my own song. God, I need to get a different song. How did they get through all the like, material then? Or like, what's in the end? Well, because they, they just don't have this much. Yeah, we do. They have like two, a uh, week and a half. What do you got, Sydney? Cola, on your whiteboard, please tell me. What is it called? So this morning, I was 35 minutes late to work. And late for work in, for me is being here after 6.45, because I get here before 6.45 every day. Because there's a lot that goes on in here, Davi. Okay? There's a lot that happens, and i got to make sure it's ready to go, and I need to have less crazy. So this morning, I had a really... I got here at 7.15. That is crazy for me. So on the way... I was driving up Cleveland, and there was just cars, like, completely stranded in the middle of the road. There was, like, 12 cars. So the police diverted us on to Kennedy. I was like, okay, so how am I going to get there? So I go up Kennedy, but Kennedy was flooded on the two outside lanes. So it was only one lane, so it was super slow. And then I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to cut down this road. Well, that road was a terrible road. So I had to go cut down another road, got to Henderson, then there was a trash can in the road. That was causing a huge mess. So I had to cut down another road. Then I got to Dale Mabry, and that was a disaster this morning. And then I finally got to work 7.15. What did I just demonstrate? Um, did you think I was just wasting our lives? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's called the whiteboard question, Lucas. <laughs> I, I, like, I thought you were asking what's going on. Oh, I thought it was going to be insight because you're like, oh, I'll turn down this road. No. Well, if you draw it out, that's fine. No, it's intellectual. Rats don't sit there and draw out the map and then decide. Uh, yeah. On your whiteboard. Nope, I'm done. Oh, I'm going to use it later. All right, so uh, did we do, we did latent learning, correct? Um, We're in insight. Did we cover it at all or no? Yeah, aha. Uh -huh. Like I have the word application. Cool. All right. So, Insight's famous learning example is Kohler. And his is the monkey in the little pen. So, what happens is the chimp inside the little pen, where they're keeping the chimp, they have two separate parts, like a stick that they broke in half that you could put together. And they have it spread out so the monkey would have to find each part and then know to put them together. And then they put a banana outside the kennel. And then after a little bit of time, the monkey is like trying to grab the banana but can't grab the banana. And then eventually the monkey's like, ha! Aha! Eureka! And they go and put the stick together, grab the banana, and that. We did the pigeons though, did we not? Yeah. Okay. We did uh, the chimp with the water yes. and the cup. Okay, that's all insight. So learned helplessness is the tendency to fail to act, to escape from a situation because of a history of repeated failures in the past. Yeah. Oh, gross. <laughs> what a waste of time. All right, if you look back here, I have it all done. Uh, done. I didn't want to download the video clip because it's golden retrievers getting electrocuted. Like Sad. All right, here we go. So let me explain it to you. It is by Selgman, and you need to know his name. This is one of your 64 experiments, and so you need to be able to say the name, how the experiment was set up, and what did we learn from it. What? No. This was in the 60s before we started caring about it more. All right? Okay, so listen, and you can write down as I go over some. Okay. So, we have little golden retriever puppies. I thought those were so cute. No? Fine. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so we put golden retriever puppies in a kennel that was um, no way out, okay? And they electrocute the whole thing. So, if you are a dog who, I think they were like six months old, little baby puppies. So, they put the little puppy on the little kennel, close the kennel door so the puppy can't leave. And the whole thing, 100% is electrocuted. What is the dog going to do? Well, he's going to get electrocuted, but he's just going to sit there and say, yeah, I'm getting electrocuted. Or is he going to run around? He's going to run around. He's going to be like, ah, just like you would do if I would electrocute you, correct? You'd run around all chaotically. So during week one, they electrocute 
50% of the kennel for five days in a row, for five minutes. So for five minutes, the dog's running around super chaotically, five days in a row. During week two, they electrocute 90% of the kennel. So 10% of it is safe. They always put the dog on the same side, the side that's always going to be electrocuted until the very end, does that make sense? So every week it goes down a percentage and they always put it on the electrocuted side. So after five days of running around and not being able to escape, second week, when they do it 90%, is the dog gonna run as hard? No, because did he find any escape before? No. So he's not gonna run as fast, he's not gonna run as far, and he's gonna keep moving, 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 moving. Do you think he's gonna find the 90%? Carolyn, do you think he's going to? No, absolutely not, because he's not gonna be running that far, he's not gonna be going that wild, because he learned that there was no escape here. So, after five days of doing 80%, they go to week three. During week three, they charge it 80%. And the dog is always put on the same spot and he wanders around. Is he going to be moving as quickly? Is he going to be trying as hard? No. By the end, every single week, it goes down by a percentage. By the time they get to week seven and eight, the dog refuses to move. So when they get to week 10, when they're only electrocuting 10% of the kennel, literally where the dog is sitting, the dog doesn't even move. All the dog has to do is fall for it and he's safe. The dog doesn't move. Why? You raise your hand and tell me why. Lucas. He doesn't think that. Yeah. Absolutely. So why try, correct? Because when you try, you put yourself out there. When you put yourself out there, you can get rejected, you can get your hopes up and stuff like that. This is learned helplessness, ladies and gentlemen. This is not just a dog getting electrocuted problem. Have you ever met someone who doesn't try anything they do? Or at school? Okay, some kids, you know a kid who's like just fails everything and they're like, oh, who cares, I don't care, who cares, I don't care, right? That's not helplessness. They're taught this. This is what my master's thesis was on. Uh, was about how socioeconomic effects learned helplessness in Hillsborough County Schools and what can be done to overcome it. So what I did is I talked to a lot of my lower socioeconomic kids. Why do poor or lower socioeconomic people have learned helplessness in a massive and epidemic rate? Why? You can raise your hand and tell me why. Think about it. Why do poor people have learned helplessness? Lucas? Absolutely. Okay. If you are in a low socioeconomic status, you typically see your parents get fired and rehired, fired and rehired over and over again in low paying jobs, correct? Do you really think uh, people who have watched their parents struggle financially really think that they're the ones who are gonna get out or do you think they're nothing special? Hello? That they're nothing special, so why try? No matter what I do, I'm never going to graduate college. I'm never going to go anywhere. I'm just going to be living in this crappy place. Why try? That's learned helplessness. It's a massive systemic problem that we have here in the United States. When we have people who are failing schools, it's not because they failed one class, ladies and gentlemen. You don't fail high school because you failed one class. You don't fail high school because you failed one test. You get that test over and over again. When you see people who hate school. Now, I think we can all agree, some days we really hate school, yes? But overall, you see it as a means to an end, correct? Then you may not like waking up early every day, and I am so excited for next year's schedule. <laughs> I don't have to be here until 8.30, so I'm gonna wake up at 4.45, walk my dog, go to the gym for 5.30, go home, take a shower, come to school to teach at 8.30, then at 4.30, at 3.30, I can go home, take a nap for an hour every day, wake up, make dinner. <gasps> I'm so excited. What's the new school? What's the new school? School starts at 8.30. Where the hell have you been? 8.30 at 3.30. I thought it was going to be 7.15. Three forty-five. Three forty-five. 3.45. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
was early release 225? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is even relevant to me. I know, but you'll be in Florida next year. I like it. I wish you'd be in relationship with 10 days off. Can we go back? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is learned helplessness. If you know someone who is in an abusive relationship, whether physical or verbal, which at some point you probably do know someone, correct? They are experiencing learned helplessness. People who have high value of self-worth do not take physical or emotional abuse. Does that make sense? If you or someone you know and care about is in an abusive relationship, physical, emotional, verbal, whatever it is, it's because you think that's as best as you can do. Well, if I'm not with him, if I'm not with her, then no one's gonna want me. It's not that big of a deal, who cares? That's learned helplessness. If you're in a situation like that, you've accepted that you're not better than that, so why bother? That is learned helplessness to attain, ladies and gentlemen. That no matter what you do, nothing's going to change, so do nothing. So that's why when you look at situations like Chicago, like the Daily Show was in Chicago all week, and they did a bunch of stuff last night for it. With that, when you have systematic violence like Chicago does, the reason is people feel like they have nothing to lose because they have nothing to gain. Chicago is a, is a murder capital of the country by amount. The population is also high as well. But because those people in that city have no economic opportunity. If you have no economic opportunity, is it worth going to school? Is it worth following the law? No. Doing drugs, having street cred, doing all those things gives you an escape from failure at school, failure at life. Like failure at natural, normal uh, family values that we have here in the United States. That's why that's happening. So when you see people who are in abusive relationships, who don't care about school, who don't genuinely care about normal things to care about and say, oh, who cares? They've been taught that. They've been taught that, and it's been reinforced over and over and over again that they don't have value. No matter what they do at school, it doesn't matter. It won't change. Nothing matters. That's unhealthy. Isn't that the saddest thing in the world? No? Cool. It is so sad. You don't have just uh, learned helplessness out of nowhere. It's taught to you over and over and reinforced over and over and over again. Carson. In the book, it says something about depression. I mean, think about it. It's called, the whole experiment's called depressed dogs. They just don't even try helping themselves. I mean, someone who is not depressed isn't going to just sit there and get electrocuted. Would you agree? Like, for instance, if you were in a really abusive, verbal, emotional relationship, if you're a happy-go-lucky person, you're going to tolerate it. But if you're a depressed person who has very little self-worth, you're going to tolerate that. No, absolutely not. You know, it's, it's that whole circumventing. This is all I can do. No matter what I do, it's never going to get better. If I'm not with her, if he's not with me, then, you know, it's only going to be worse, you know, so I'll just sit here and take it. That's all it is. All right, observational learning is learning a new behavior by watching a model perform a behavior. This is the most common type of learning humans do. Okay, dogs. So, I have a puppy. His name's Toby. My Toby. <laughs> um, I will never get another dog. When this dog dies in 10 years, I'm done. I'm exhausted. McCray has illusion, has like dreams of grant of like this whole beautiful idea of having a little sidekick for Toby, and he wants a little dog because it'd be funny to have a big burly dog and a tiny little dog who's like the boss. That's the only reason why he wants it. And apparently, if you have an old dog and a young dog, the old dog teaches the young dog how to behave. Observational learning. So essentially, McCray's like, well, before Toby dies. We'll get another dog, and that then Toby can teach the little dog how to do it, so we don't have to do it because it's exhausting. I'm exhausted from a dog. How am I going to raise a child? Oh, I won't. Perfect. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm literally exhausted. This morning I woke up at 4:40. You want a mini minute? 
No. Could you imagine how cranky I would be with a kid? It's good. Get one next year. Get one what? Yeah, if you're oh, just go pick one up. <laughs> I know, McCray and I talked about adopting. I think McCray really wants to adopt if we have kids. If, if. Which I think is really beautiful. What a really wonderful thing. He's so wonderful. Huh? All right, so when we talk about um, observational learning. The famous experiment that we cite is uh, Bandora's. Oh, it is Darth Vader reading Harry Potter. I um, mean, it's awesome. I don't know why you wouldn't think it was awesome. Stop it. Okay, so Bandora's famous experiment is going to be looking at observational learning. So, Bandora records, you're going to want to write this down, by the way, and you're going to see, nice, Bandora is observational learning, Bobo doll experiment is what I'm going to show you right now, that's done by Bandora, make sure you're tying names to experiments here, people. So, Bandora is the observational learning. Observational learning, under observational learning in that box, I would write social learning. Social learning and observational learning are the same thing. So, every single one of us, no one came to school today in a chicken outfit, which I'm really disappointed. I'd really like that to happen. We're just saying in general, in like life. Uh, maybe tomorrow after this Halloween. Say what? It's like Wicked Wednesday. Oh, it's Wicked Wednesday. Are you going to dress up? <laughs> I teach high school, but I don't do any of that stuff. No, you <coughs> I, you are right. Do a lot of teachers dress up? Yeah. He does, but he always has a fit. He's a tie for every occasion. You have to appreciate that. See, I don't care. He apparently had like a tropical parrot tie, but he decided to not wear it. Well, see, I wore, I wore and I used to dress up like my first, my innocent years, my early years of teaching. And one of the, my co-teachers was like, um, you do know this is for seniors in high school, not grown-ups. So never again. <laughs> Observational <laughs> learning <laughs> by experience. I know, right? It was so cute. It was a dress. It was a Hawaiian dress that I bought in Hawaii. Authentic. Well, I don't know how authentic. I don't think real Hawaiians wear tacky uh, floral prints, but that's fine. No. All right, so the Bobo doll experiment. So what happens is uh, Bandora records a woman beating up a Bobo doll. Okay, she take, picks up a hammer, picks it up, beats the crap out of the Bobo doll. He videotapes it and then shows a bunch of kindergartners. The woman beating up the video. You want to see the woman beat up the, the yes. doll? She's got a lot of rage, so you have to appreciate it. Okay, so this is... It's a big doll. It is. Apparently, it was, like, super popular in the 50s. Like, people, like your grandparents... There was sound, but it's a really awkward... Oh, my gosh, and they bounce back up? I used to have one. Okay, so here is um, Bandora's, like, assistant. Beating up the Bobo doll. As you, she, as you see, she's kicking it. She's picking it up. She picks up a hammer at some point. She sits on it, <laughs> pummels it, all that stuff. So, they record it. Then they go and show a room full of kindergartners the video of an adult beating up a Bobo doll. It is important that you understand that they're sending the children into a different room. They're sending the kids into a room that's surrounded by other options of toys. But in the room, there is a Bobo doll. So the kids can go in and play with the kitchenette, the stove. They can go play with... The horse, there's a little toy horse you could play on. You could play on whatever they want, but there's also a Bobo doll. Every single kid goes straight for the... You ready to see this kid rage? Yes. That's awesome. Okay, so this kid goes straight for the Bobo doll. As you can see, the behavior he's mimicking right now is just what he saw. Okay, he's kicking it. Okay, he's punching it. Same thing we saw in the previous video, except this kid's face is so menacing. Okay, so he picks up the hammer. Did the, women, did the woman use the hammer? 
Yeah, she does use the hammer. So he picks up the hammer. Look at that face. Look at that baseball swing, though. That's a good swing. One-handed, that's a good swing. Look at it. He's so intense, and he's going straight for the nose. Okay, so he climbs on it, hits it right with the hammer, beats the crap out of it. He's talking crap to it. Like, there's no way he's not talking crap to the Bobo doll. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> right? Like, how does that make any sense? I have no idea why. Okay, so he's climbing it on it, smacking it. He's having a good time. Okay? So, then the children are going to start wandering around the room, and he finds a gun. Look at him. He's so intense. He's holding it up. He's threatening the clown's life. See? Yeah, that kid is totally talking some crap to that doll. Okay? Right to the nose. <laughs> Okay, he's punching him, smacking him with the gun. Was the gun used in the original video? No. 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 The original video shows... <laughs> he's got the gun and the hammer at the same time. And the original video, the woman was climbing on him, punching him with the hammer, doing all that stuff. The kid is now at it. Now, we got girls. Ladies, you got rage too. Here's my little girl in her little green velvet dress. Look how cute she is as she savagely beats the crap out of the Bobo doll. <laughs> right? I mean, this girl's got creative rage. Picking it up, throwing it around. Now, she does get distracted by the other toys, but don't you worry. Her rage will not be tamed. She's coming back. Okay, she gets a little distracted. More so than the last kid. But now, full-on hammer swings. Thor style. Okay, like, okay, now she's using balls to hit the Bobo doll. She is tossing anything she possibly, she's having a great time. Like the little ponytails going back and forth. She, like, she's using the ball on the wall to smack, like, she is totally going to town right now. We got the gun? Look at him, right in the butt, man. Not even in the front of him, straight to the butt. Okay, and she's just giggling. Now we got a baby doll being wounded. <laughs> she's throwing the baby. Oh, look at that. Oh my God. So much rage. Just straight up tackles. Okay. So, we recorded a woman beating up a Bobo doll. We showed it to a bunch of children. I think we can all understand right off the cuff. It makes sense that the kids would mimic the behavior they saw. The thing that really disturbed Bandora, and that you need to write down, is that not only was the behavior mimicked, but it was increased with alternative violence. And the alternative violence in both of them was what? The gun. The gun. Okay, so when a child sees violence, they mimic it, and they add their own little twist to it. Now, this is important for multiple uh, reasons. The uh, Bobo doll is a big experiment. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, Bandora did it with a live clown once, like a human being clown, in the same results. <laughs> same results. The clown got the crap being out of it by kids. Okay? So, this is important. Now, we still use observational learning. When um, you see how to dress, observational learning when you go to the mall would people like this are people wearing this those are all different types of things okay when you first time you start trying to flirt with the opposite sex you're using observational learning of like well how to flirt how to pick up chicks what lines to use all those different types of things it's all done by observational learning and watching your peers it happened to your peers watching different experiences on TV all those different types of things influence it so if we live our life and observational learning has the biggest effect on it, why aren't we all serial killers? Because we've all seen a murder scene at this point. If observational learning is such a big deal, why aren't we all arrested for being serial killers? Why? Why are you not arrested? Why, Carson? We saw what happened to serial, we saw what happened to serial killers. Okay, we start seeing consequences. Okay, why, why aren't we going around beating up people after we watch a TV show with people like, how many of you watched the fight a couple months ago, that big massive fight, all that stuff, did you come to school the next day and start punching people? You did? <laughs> okay, why didn't we? Why didn't we come to school and beat people up, Sydney? 
There's punishments. We know that there's right and wrong. We know when to do something and when not to do something. Do little kids have that line? No. Hence why they saw an adult do something. So what did they do? They mimicked it. Because if an adult can do it, then they can too. Every single one of us has seen something that we probably shouldn't have seen at a young age, correct? For some reason, I saw it as a very small child. The original one. And that is like horrifyingly creepy. Because there's no, there's very little special effects. It's just a creepy guy in a creepy costume saying really creepy things. Okay, I saw it at a very young age and it was jarring. Okay, every single one of you saw something you probably shouldn't have seen at a young age, correct? And it definitely affected you. If you saw something at a young age, you can't unsee it, so you're more likely to see more things like that. Okay? Observational learning is how we learn how to interact with people. So if you're coming from a home where there's verbal, physical, or emotional abuse, what do you learn that's okay? Verbal, physical, and emotional abuse. So if you see that your mom is verbally abusing your father, what do you expect to do in your future? Or what relationships do you expect to see? Verbal abuse. If you see physical abuse, what do you expect to see? Physical abuse. When we talk about observational learning, it's both the good things and the bad things. Each and every single one of you carries your parents' mistakes. Your parents are not perfect people, yes? They've made mistakes. Okay? You are going to carry those mistakes to your own family, and you're going to ruin your own family in some way. You are. Absolutely. My parents have been married for 40 years next week. Yeah. I know marriage is not easy, ladies and gentlemen. They went months without speaking. In high school, oh my God, my mother's crazy, so it's important to keep that in context. But they, I saw how hard marriage is. So when McCray and I were dating for about five year, uh, four years, we started talking about marriage and getting married and stuff like that. I come from a home where they've been married for like 40 years. Do I have a positive or negative view on marriage? Positive. Do I know that it's hard work? Yes. And that there are dark times? <laughs> yes. So I went in with this whole idea, like I kind of understand marriage and stuff like that. Like I get it. McCray comes from a house where he didn't know until age 11 that moms and dads lived in the same house because he never saw it. His family, his parents were divorced when he was three months old. So he's never lived in a house with a man in his house until he was 17 years old. How do you think that went? Not well. <laughs> Not well at all. But him and his stepdad are now besties, so it's good. But did not go well. Um, so when we were talking about getting married, McCray's like, I'm not getting married. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I'm not going to be like your girlfriend for the rest of our life together. Like, we're going to get married. And he's like, no, I'm not getting married. It took him a very long time to come around to it. On his own time and his own process, he came around to the idea of like, you know what, let's do this. And now he's like, ride or die marriage. He loves being married. A, because he's spoiled. And I've treated the relationship different as a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship to now married. It's totally different. I cater to my husband. I support my husband. It's totally different than boyfriend-girlfriend. Because, like, there's paperwork now. Like, this has to work. This has to work. So it was a different dynamic. And it is. When you take those vows, it's a different dynamic. So I hope you got a ride or die. Take your time. But that's another day. So when we talk about observational learning, McCray didn't know how this whole marriage thing worked. Because he's never seen it in action, and that was really troubling to him, and which makes a lot of sense. I've seen how marriage works, I know how hard it is, and I brought that to the relationship. When we're talking about your future dating, and when I mean future dating, I know you guys are dating now, and that's really great, and it's important that you start the dating process, but I'm talking about your first real relationship where you are living together, you are mixing money, you are mixing families, good luck with that. Okay? Thanksgiving is going to be real awkward this year in my house. Fun fact. So much drama. Anyway, so your first real relationship, when you're mixing all of those things and trying to figure out where your life's going, your parents' mistakes, your parents' successes are going to follow you into that relationship, just like they followed McCray and myself. That's observational learning. One of the biggest reasons why I don't want to have kids is because I didn't have a perfect childhood, yet I had a good childhood. 
And I don't want to mess up my kids. Because exposing them to things too early can mess them up. Okay? Me not being a very patient person. I don't think anyone in this room would be like, oh my God, Miss Bennett, she's so patient and so kind. Right? I'm absolutely neither <laughs> of those two things. I don't want to shape my kids in the wrong way. Because they're going to learn from me, they're going to learn from my husband, and I don't want that responsibility because I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. A dog is overwhelming. Okay? When we talk about observational learning, the reason why I'm terrified of kids, for multiple reasons, but the biggest thing is, is I want to, if I have a kid, I want the best thing for that kid. I don't know if I'm the best thing for a kid. Because I don't want to go to soccer practice on a Tuesday. I just want to sit on my couch with my dog, you know? Like... I don't want to, like, go trick-or-treating. And that sounds awful. I don't want to hang out with other moms. I don't want to do those things. I don't think it's fair. When you approach your neck, your first major relationship that has those three major funds, mixing money, mixing, like, personal spaces and all that stuff, you're going, your parents are going to be a part of it. How well their relationship works. Now, my dad... Um, came from a household. So my grandfather fought in World War II. He fought in Japan, and he was on the islands. You know anything about World War II? The last place you'd ever want to be is on the islands. Um, he was a uh, he was a war prisoner of war. He was captured for two and a half years, almost starved to death. Came back, uh, never recovered. Uh, he was a complete drunk, would go to the bar every single day, come home and beat the crap out of his wife and his three children. Every day. Got fired from every single job, had nothing. So my father grew up in that household where his big brother would take the blows, the fists from him to protect the little brother. My dad grew up not wanting to have kids. I think growing up in an environment like that, you wouldn't want kids either. Well, ta-da! Here I am. Okay? And my father knew by watching what his father did, beating the crap out of his wife, beating the crap out of his kids, that's not what he wanted to do. So he tried to go the opposite way with it. He was going to have kids. He was going to do it right. He came to every soccer practice. He came to every special event. He came to everything. My dad's a ride or die. Flawed. Because he didn't have the role model himself. Does that make sense? But he did the very best he can. Just because you learn something doesn't mean you're stuck with it. But it takes a lot to overcompensate for it, correct? It is hard to change behaviors. It's hard to change who you are. That's why observational learning is such a big deal. How does it feel that you're probably going to turn into your parents? That your future relationships are going to be based on the baggage from your parents' relationship? No one's parents has a perfect relationship, ladies and gentlemen. I hope your parents have a good relationship, and I hope they get along, and I hope you see what love looks like on a daily basis. However, we're in 2017, and 53% of all marriages end in divorce, which end in complications, yes? Hopefully you see what love looks like, because McCray has never seen what two people living together and what love looks like until he was 17 years old. Okay? Those things affect how you interact, how you share, how you communicate. Would you agree? So all of those things. So think about how messed up you are. Think about how messed up the love of your life is. Who is waiting for you in four, five, six, ten years. Hopefully ten years so you know who you are. Anyway. That's observational learning. What a high point, right? So it's hard. Life's hard. Don't grow up. Bye. Wait, you have to grow up so you never grow up. Don't grow up. Hey, you don't. Don't grow up. Don't grow up. What the hell? Why would she say that? I know.